Good morning. It being 8.30, I am calling to order this meeting of the House Early Childhood Finance and Policy Committee. I'm uh, Representative Dave Pinto, the chair of the committee, and welcome uh, back to all for uh, uh, the uh, 2022 legislative session. Um, a reminder that this meeting is being held pursuant to House Rule 10.01, which allows for virtual hearings of this type. Um, and I want to direct the attention of the of members of the public to our committee website, where you'll find uh, the committee's agenda and meeting materials, et cetera, and, and a lot of useful stuff there. Um, so we're going to start, uh, as usual, by having the clerk take the roll. And so uh, uh, this will be Mr. Doslin's first uh, chance to do that. So uh, Mr. Doslin, please call the roll. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Representative Pinto, Chair. Present. Representative Pryor, Vice Chair. Present. Representative Franson. Present. Representative Bennett. Present. Representative Bolden. Present. Representative Daniels. Present. Representative Daphne. Present. Representative Damon. Present. Representative Jurgens. Present. Representative Cotiza Witum. Present. Representative Morrison. Morrison present. Representative Wozlowick. Present. Representative Voldemont. Present. We have a quorum. Thank you, Mr. Doslind, and thank you all. We have a full house today, and nice to have uh, nice to have full attendance uh, to see everyone here. Um, so uh, we are joined today by a couple of uh, new staff members that I want to make sure to acknowledge and introduce. I'm really excited to have them uh, on board. Uh, we have a new committee administrator, a new committee legislative assistant, and then a new uh, House fiscal staff representative uh, on the education side. Um, Emily Adrians, who was our uh, House fiscal uh, staff member in that area, is now the chief uh, fiscal analyst for the House, and so really um, uh, excited for her on that promotion. Uh, and so I'm going to start with uh, Ms. Spreck, the new uh, committee administrator, uh, and uh, Sydney Spreck, please uh, just introduce yourself. Hello, everyone. I'm Sydney Spreck. Uh, you may have worked with me previously. I was the committee legislative assistant for state government finance and for Chair Michael Nelson and Representative John Hewitt. And I now have early childhood and education policy as my committees. Thank you, Ms. Breck. So, so uh, members, we may see, uh, you may see um, Ms. Breck uh, in that role supporting Chair Richardson as well. And uh, been delighted to have her on board. I think it's been uh, just a little bit over a month um, and uh, um, she's uh, doing really well. So, so glad to have you. Then a new committee um, legislative assistant, uh, Hans Dozland. Mr. Doslin, please introduce yourself. Good morning, everyone. My name is Hans Doslin. This is my first session. I came previously from working in the unsheltered minor and young adult world and really gained an appreciation for how vital it is to ensure that our state's youngest individuals and their families uh, that support them have a safe, stable, and equitable environment which they can thrive in. I'm super excited for this session. Hopefully, we can achieve some, some good stuff. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Doslin. Uh, and then uh, finally, um, uh, the fiscal analyst that I mentioned, uh, Solve Beckel. Um, if you could, Ms. Beckel, if you could please introduce yourself. Uh, thank you, Chair. Yes, uh, my name is Solve Beckel. Uh, I'm sure I'm a familiar face to many of you. I spent the last three years working as the Jobs, Commerce, and Energy fiscal analyst. Um, but when this opportunity opened up, I just thought it, it was too good to pass up. So very excited to be working in the education world with all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Beckel. And, and uh, I have that, uh, that publication from House Research on uh, school finance uh, financing. Um, I'm not saying that ain't quite right, but in any case, that is a big and complicated area. And Chair Davin is very familiar with that as well. And so uh, I'm, uh, I'm really glad to have your help um, in uh, helping us think through all this. Um, and I do want to make sure to acknowledge um, our returning staff because I've been incredibly reliant on them and I suspect other members of the committee have as well. Um, Mars Beltrani Rudquist, the DFL researcher, Jody Withers, GOP researcher, um, and Annie Mock, our house researcher, and Doug Berg, who is uh, Ms. Beckel's equivalent on the HHS side. Uh, all four of them uh, have uh, given great service to the, to the people of Minnesota. I have the least chance to work with Mr. Withers, of course, because he's supporting the GOP team. Um, um, but all my experiences with him and with the other members have convinced me, the other staff members have convinced me um, that uh, we are very, very well served by all four of them. And so uh, glad to have uh, everybody on board. Um, so uh, we need to do a little bit of past business. I'm going to ask um, Representative Pryor if she would move approval of the minutes of our last meeting from June 26th of 2021. 
So moved. Thank you, uh, Representative Pryor. And reminder members of the public that uh, these um, meeting minutes are on the website. Uh, any additions or corrections, anyone, to those minutes? Not hearing anything. Uh, all in favor of approval of the June 26th minutes, please say aye. 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 And any opposed? Okay, uh, Mr. Dozen, you have your first motion passing. Uh, the minutes are approved. So um, members, um, so a uh, little bit of overview of the next couple of weeks. Um, so this week, we're gonna be looking backwards to a certain extent at um, the budget that passed last session. Um, there was um, certainly compared to previous sessions, a fair amount of funding that went um, to the area of early care and learning. Um, and uh, uh, certainly far less uh, than what we had heard in, in testimony from last spring in terms of the need. Um, we wanna make sure that we understand how those funds are being used. And so we're gonna be hearing from uh, several agencies about that and also about some um, uh, spending that was not in the jurisdiction of our committee, um, but certainly relates to our, um, uh, the uh, interest in early child development. So we'll be hearing about that the next couple of, uh, of sessions uh, today and Thursday. Then next week we pivot to, instead of looking backwards to getting a snapshot of where we are now, um, we will have a joint hearing uh, next Tuesday the 8th. And we'll hear more about that at the end of this hearing uh, with the Jobs and Workforce Development Committee. Um, and then uh, on Thursday, I'm expecting us to hear um, about uh, policies and a roadmap uh, that, uh, that our state has recommended to follow from uh, um, in terms of getting uh, young children off to a great start. We had heard from Dr. Cynthia Osborne from the Prenatal the Three Policy Impact Center a year ago. And so the plan is to hear uh, an update on that. And then after that, of course, we're gonna be looking forward, which is what we need to do as a committee to say, um, what do we need to do to get uh, all children off to a great start? and, uh, and uh, what are the bills and uh, provisions and budget items that we should be considering um, as we drive towards concluding the session. So that's the overall uh, structure of things. Again, I'm expecting at the end of this hearing, we'll do a little check-in on the joint hearing for next week and uh, continue on from there. Uh, so with that, uh, so as I said, we're going to be kind of looking backwards first. And so the first item is we're going to be hearing from our house researchers uh, about uh, what was passed last session, just to remind ourselves and kind of um, get, get oriented. And then we'll be hearing from uh, representatives from uh, Children and Family Services at the DHS, Department of Human Services, uh, on uh, how some of those funds have been spent. So I'm just going to pause and see if members have any questions about kind of where we're at with things. Uh, as you know, there'll be plenty of time for that, too. Uh, and I'm not seeing any hands up right now. So I'm gonna ask Ms. Mock then, uh, who's our house researcher, uh, to go first uh, and to, just to walk us through um, some of the pieces uh, that we approved and, uh, and then we'll move on to Mr. Berg and, and Ms. Bechtel. Ms. Mock. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Annie Mock with House Research and I'm gonna briefly describe um, some of the early childhood provisions that were enacted last session. And then I'll hand it over to uh, Mr. Berg and Ms. Beckel, who will go through the fiscal tracking. Uh, so members, you'll recall that this committee passed an omnibus bill last spring. And after that omnibus left this committee, um, provisions of the bill were incorporated and enacted as parts of the K-12 and HHS omnibus bills. So among the provisions that were enacted as part of the K-12 omnibus were the extension of the 4,000 voluntary pre-kindergarten seats that would have otherwise expired. Um, those 4,000 seats were extended for fiscal years 2022 and 23. Also enacted was a prohibition on individual use screen time for children in publicly funded preschool or kindergarten programs. And that prohibition is scheduled to go into effect this coming July. Uh, one of the provisions in the HHS omnibus was a new home visiting program for pregnant women and families with young children. Under the program, MDH must award grants to um, start up or expand voluntary home visiting programs. At least 75% of those grant, uh, at least 75% of the grant money must go to evidence-based home visiting programs, and up to 25% of the grant money may go to evidence-informed or promising practice home visiting programs. Uh, no new money was appropriated for this program, but existing home visiting appropriations were redirected to be awarding uh, uh, to be awarded according to the criteria of this um, new program. Another home visiting program, the Nurse Family Partnership, um, which has been in session law and funded by legislatures for several years, was actually codified last session and the legislature appropriated money to that home visiting program. Uh, the legislature also enacted several provisions that were the result of the work of the Family Child Care Task Force. So this was a task force established by the 2019 legislature to make recommendations related to family child care licensing. Uh, and among the many provisions that were enacted last session were um, the establishment of an ombudsperson for family child care providers, 
There are several modifications to licensing and training requirements. Uh, there was some direction to DHS to, to develop tools to assist family child care providers. And there's also the establishment of a family child care training advisory committee um, to advise DHS on training requirements for licensed family child care providers. Uh, last session, the legislature also made several changes to the child care assistance program. So the child care assistance program or CCAP is the state federal program that helps lower income families pay for child care. Um, so the rates uh, for providers under that program were increased last session from the 25th percentile of the 2018 market rate survey up to the 40th percentile for infants and toddlers of the 2021 rate survey and the 30th percentile for pre preschoolers and school age children. Additionally, the rate that's paid to legal non-licensed family child care providers under that program was increased. And that increase was from 68% um, of the rate for family child care providers up to 90% of that rate. And all those new rates were effective last November. Um, additionally, the legislature temporarily modified the priorities for the waiting list for the basic sliding fee program, um, which that program is a subset of the child care assistance program. Uh, the temporary changes to the waiting list allow more families to receive child care assistance, and those modifications are in effect through May of 2024. Uh, the legislature also allocated money to the basic sliding fee program to buy down the program's waiting list. And then the legislature enacted a few other changes to the child care assistance program, um, including limiting retroactive payments to child care providers and modifying how overpayments are handled in the program. And then um, the legislature also established and funded several child care related grant programs. Um, so uh, these include money for retained grants, which are intended to incentivize individuals who are working in the child care field to actually remain in the field. And there's also money allocated for teach grants, which are designed to help early um, childhood educators increase their levels of education. Uh, the legislature also allocated money for business training for child care providers and um, allocated money to help child care, child care providers pay for facility improvements and minor renovations and um, related needs like equipment. Uh, the legislature established and funded um, workforce development grants to provide lower income individuals training and job assistance so that they can begin a career in child care. Uh, money was allocated for grants to assist family, friend, and neighbor caregivers, um, and also to establish a competitive grant program to expand access to child care for children with disabilities. And then the legislature also established and allocated money for stabilization grants to child care providers. And these are monthly grants that are available to eligible child care providers um, to help them remain open throughout and after the pandemic. Other provisions that were enacted last session include two evaluations of Parent Aware, which is the state's quality rating system for uh, child care providers. Um, one of the evaluations must examine Parent Aware's impact on outcomes, um, like children's progress towards school readiness. And those evaluation findings must be reported to the legislature by the end of 2024. The second evaluation requires DHS to conduct outreach to providers um, to identify barriers to pursuing a Parent Aware rating and DHS must report its findings by March 1st of this year. Uh, additionally, DHS is required to issue a report on foster children's participation in early care and education programs. That report is due December of this year. Um, the legislature established the Great Start for All Minnesota Children Task Force, and that task force is, is, retired, is required to develop strategies to ensure that all families in the state um, have access to affordable and high quality care for their children. The task force is required to submit preliminary findings um, this December and then a final report uh, in February of 2023. The legislature directed the Children's Cabinet to develop recommendations relating to the governance of the state's early care and learning programs. Uh, and those recommendations are due today, I believe, February 1st, 2022. Uh, and then also the legislature was directed, um, DHS and the Children's Cabinet cabinet to engage with um, a number of different entities like counties and other state agencies to develop recommendations for implementing a family focused voluntary information sharing program, um, which is intended to improve the effectiveness of public assistance programs for families. And those recommendations are due to the legislature by January of next year. And then finally, the legislature um, allocated money to DHS to cover the fees related to administering uh, child care background studies and also allocated money um, to DHS to cover the administrative and IT costs associated with um, all these new programs and efforts. And with that, I'll turn it over to Mr. Berg. 
Thank, thank you, Ms. Mock. Um, if uh, folks have clarifying questions along the way, raise your hand, but otherwise we'll, we'll keep making our way through. So Mr. Berg, we'll call on you. We are unmuted, you're muted. Working on it. I'm sorry. Uh, thank you. I am Sydney. I'm going to try to share my screen here. Yes. Um, and Mr. Chair, I hope people can see this a bit. Uh, yeah, I, I, I can, Mr. Berg. Okay. Um, I tend, I'm planning to just look at this at a very high level on sort of the totals by fund and see if there are questions, although. I will note two things. The first section of this is human services related changes. And you'll note at the top, there are four general fund items. There was not a lot of general fund activity out of this committee because we frankly, we had so much federal funding in the human services side. The very first line I'll note because members may not remember, Ms. Mock mentioned it, uh, there was, 450,000 a year added to the nurse home visiting program. That happened late as part of the conference committee negotiations. And so members of this committee will maybe not remember that that was dealt with. Uh, the other portion that Ms. Mock talked about, about codifying the base was, but this happened later. Mr. Berg, I'm just gonna pause you for one second on that too. I also wanna make sure members uh, recall that, that that account is not in our committee's jurisdiction. It's in the jurisdiction of the health committee. Um, we have an interest in it because it relates to early child development. And so it's something that we're keeping an eye on, but I, I wanna make sure to clarify that as opposed to the other. I think all of these other lines are within, uh, maybe I guess not the IT and system improvements, uh, maybe at the bottom as well, but, um, but certainly the, the home visiting is not uh, an account that we have jurisdiction over. That's correct, Mr. Chair, and I, that's one thing where I, you'll see that MDH is at first line and everything else is D, uh, DHS, which is a clue on there, but I will, it's, it's a little murkier on in the committee versus not. The general fund items are where this is kind of an issue. You see, we have a small amount for child care, the, the systems cost for the child care rate changes we did, and there was a governor's initiative that uh, changed the way uh, the department deals with CCAP retroactive payments that save money. That actually started in Representative Liebling's committee, but nonetheless, it has an impact on the C CCAP program. So I'm showing it here. And the, ver the bottom one in the general fund there, I'll note, and maybe the chair is not even thinking of this one. This is, there was a new program we started up for three years that provides childcare grants for providers serving children with disabilities. This was part of the HCBS enhanced FMAP money that we dealt with a lot. And that will that whole gar uh, garbled sentence will not make a lot of sense to probably most of the members, but um, the federal government is part of the ARPA package enhance the federal matching rate we got on certain medical assistance services, which gave us a substantial amount of money to spend. That money was put in the general fund. And this is one of the eligible things that was done with it was to create, a, I, I don't know if you would call it a pilot program. It exists in statute or it's funded for three years because that's how long this funding lasts to start up a new program or new payment the availability to childcare providers who serve uh, children with disabilities. So that one's not, ex it didn't come out of this committee, but it is, you know, I think obviously of interest to this committee. Um, and so the total general fund is low. There was a, a these net out to 3.4 million in spending in 22, 23 and a savings of 307,000 to the general fund in uh, the tails in 24 and 25. The main action for the childcare portion was in the next two sections, which are, we had really two pots of federal childcare money that we were dealing with. The first one here, the next one on the schedule is uh, the CCDBG that stands for Child Care Development Block Grant. Also as part of the pandemic uh, additional funding, the federal government gave us a substantial increase in the availability of our CCDBG block grant money. There is 
money we get every year for that from the federal government. And then we got a substantial additional portion, again, with a three year uh, spending horizon on it. Um, that paid for most of the just sort of roughly grouping the the rate changes that Ms. Mock talked about. And you can see the various uh, retain and teach grants and uh, uh, a whole slew of the things that Ms. Mock talked about were funded through CCDBG funds, 180.8 million in 22-23 and 139.5 million in the tails. Um, I'll, uh, well, I'll finish what I'm talking about and then I'll make one further comment about a complication in all of this that uh, is a good one, but... Uh, Going down to the last section of the human services changes, these are referred to as stabilization funds. Again, as part of the pandemic legislation, Congress passed, the state got $324.2 million of stabilization, federal stabilization funds. The bulk of these, you'll see the third row of that is called child care public health grants. Um, it was required by uh, the federal law that I believe it's 90% of that money go out in payments to providers that they can apply for. I mean, we could um, it, it really just support payments for businesses and it, it had to uh, cover 90% of those funds. And then you'll see some other things that we uh, were able to do with the um, additional funding out of that. <clears throat> Again, that's 324.2 million, all of which was allocated in fiscal 22, but which has to be spent over the next three years. Um, and just one um, technical thing I'll mention about how things happened in the November forecast that may I hesitate to, because it might raise more questions than we can answer. The child care projections that were at the end of the session, by the time we got to November, MMB and DHS realized that the child care demand had not come back in fiscal 22 uh, anywhere near the amount that they had anticipated it would. And so they reduced the amount of MFIP child care that is paid for by the general fund to zero and paid for 100% of that demand in fiscal 22 with CCDBG funds, or yes. And then they upped the amount of, uh, that reduced the amount of TANF funds as well. We spent, uh, actually I'm, I'm jumping ahead of step. Then they, to maintain our maintenance of effort for TANF, the Temporary Assistance to Needy Families Block Grant, they increased the amount of cash grant for MFIP cash. And that had the effect of reducing the amount of TANF cash that was spent on MFIP, but it maintained our MOE, so we got our whole TANF Block Grant. The net result of this is that the two changes I mentioned on the general fund of not spending general fund on uh, the MFIP child care, but increasing general fund spending on MFIP cash, net out to a savings to the general fund of uh, 10 some million, uh, a little over 10 million. And then because of the changes I mentioned in the TANF fund, the balance in the TANF fund went up by I, uh, I hesitate, I haven't got that number right at the top of my head, but I think it's in the neighborhood of 40 some million. I might be off on that. I'll check on that and get back to you. So um, that is a complicated thing that happened in the forecast. Probably if I hadn't mentioned that, you would never know that, but it was to the benefit of the state, both the general fund and the TANF fund. So. Um, and with that, I will, um, unless there are questions, I'll turn the last section over to Ms. Beckel. Uh, yeah, why don't we, um, uh, Mr. Berg, I'll note you, 
you referenced there being a, a complicated issue there at the end, and I, I, some of the members may be thinking there's a number of complicated aspects as there. So yeah, because uh, we members, we are in the maybe both fortunate and challenging position of being in the middle of both HHS and, and education finance, and both have um, a lot of complexities to them. Um, yeah, I'm thinking, why don't we, since it's a short section, uh, Ms. Becca, we'll have you go, and then as members, we can have some, uh, see what questions there are. So, um, and I should probably just, Ms. Becca, just as you're starting, I'll note that uh, that some of this, uh, a number of these lines, in fact, uh, I think are in the jurisdiction of Chair Dabney's Education Finance Committee as well, similar to what I referenced home visiting. Um, and if you can just uh, acknowledge that too, but Ms. Beckel, please go. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, yes, so at the bottom of the spreadsheet here, um, you'll see the first line, VPK maintain current levels. So that was the extension of the uh, VPK program for fiscal years 22 and 23 only. Uh, and all of the other items underneath that are relating to that. So this um, involved a formula increase. And so because it was a change to the formula, it meant that all these other items beneath would change as well. So you can see the increased numbers for fiscal years 22 and 23. And then if you're curious about the fiscal year's 24 changes, that just represents that 90-10 split that the education formula uses. So it's 90% um, in one year, and then it's 10% in the following year. Um, and you can see that the special education increase is a little off from that 90-10 split. Um, that one just generally uh, is, is a different um, percentage split. Um, so overall, the change in funding for maintaining the current levels of voluntary pre-kindergarten uh, was roughly 39.9 million um, in the first biennium and then 2.0 in the, in the second biennium. Thank you, Ms. Beckell. And actually, as I look at this, I think pretty much, I think every single one of these uh, passed through uh, was included in Chair Dabney's um, budget in the end, as opposed to moving from ours, um, because the, it was the formula that, um, that the VPK uh, voluntary pre-K spending um, passes through. Is that, is that correct? Just want to make sure folks are clear about kind of um, what, what is include, what would be included in our budget versus not. That is correct. Um, we just included this in this spreadsheet because it was related to, to early education. Um, but yes, all of this is linked to the formula. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, uh, members, are there questions for um, Mr. Berg or Ms. Uh, or Ms. Beckel or Ms. Mock for that matter? Just looking to see if there's, if there's hands. Um, and just as we're waiting for that, um, Mr. Berger, whoever's controlling this, I think you are Mr. Berg. if you could scroll back up to the top. I did want to verify one thing. You mentioned uh, the line near the top about, uh, uh, I got the fourth line, fourth line down there about grants for providers serving children with disabilities. And it mentioned that that maybe hadn't passed through our committee. I believe it was um, Representative Wozniak's bill and that it actually, that that one did, was heard in our committee. Um, and so just want to make sure that I was remembering that correctly, at least. Um, Ms. Mock may be able to help us on that or, um, or otherwise. Uh, Mr. Chair, I, I think that's right. Maybe Annie can confirm. I, I think you're right. My memory was failing me. I kind of, it didn't hit my radar as a funding thing until conference, but you may be, I think, remembering correctly. Yeah, no no problem. Um, I see Representative Fryer has her hand up. Representative Fryer. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I, you know, probably my question is something that might be answered later in, the, in, in this meeting um, or at a future meeting. But especially listening to how we've been able to uh, move funds, as as Mr. Berg was describing, um, for net savings, um, to acknowledge that you know it's taking a while for um, for families to get back into the workforce, recover from the the pandemic, and all of those kinds of things that the demand for childcare had been less than had we had budgeted for. And so I guess what I kind of like the bottom line is, you know, before we had wait lists for our different programs um, and for the basic sliding fee. And um, I, I guess at some point I'd like to find out where we stand on those wait lists if we have eliminated them. Maybe a question for Ms. Mock, perhaps Representative Price, are you nodding? So Representative, uh, pardon me, Ms. Mock, if you can just provide any thoughts on that. 
Uh, the last, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, Representative Pryor, the last wait list I saw from um, DHS, the wait list for the basic sliding fee program was uh, much, much smaller. Um, I think it was down to a few hundred uh, in, uh, children on the wait list, uh, but maybe DHS can confirm that. This would probably be a good question, Representative Pryor, for for uh, for DHS. So uh, maybe we'll maybe we'll direct that to them if that makes sense to you. Um, I see your your hand is down, and so I'm just going to see if we have any any others. Um, I guess I'll just note this can be a little bit misleading what we're looking at, uh, only because the funds going in through different committees, et cetera. Um, as I recall from um, at the end of June of 2021, that. Uh, uh, in the area of childcare and early learning, we actually generated savings for state spending. Um, you'll see the line there, uh, CCAP retroactive payments um, actually has a savings of uh, uh, 637 million in the one year, et cetera. So uh, this area actually saved money for the general fund and then was spending federal dollars on almost all of this. Um, so in fact, in a way our state went backwards in terms of our state investment um, from last spring and certainly it's something that we're gonna be, um, that we wanna be, want to be looking at, so. And Mr. Um, Chair, just since you're on that point and I'm looking at it, I note that there is an error on the spreadsheet and it has copied the, on the, 2223 total it has copied the line above it below and it should have you see there are savings in both years and that should add to a net savings not a cost so yeah, and and i and i think i misspoke too i said 637 million that would be 637 thousand uh, on that line so my apologies big difference there uh, mr berg was there something else no that's it just that I, since you mentioned it I, I i noted an error on the sheet but Okay. Well, not seeing any more uh, questions. Uh, really appreciate our house research team putting this together. Uh, it's been many months since we were doing this work and felt like an a, a sure. important thing to, uh, to connect. So, um, so now I'm, I'm uh, calling up um, the, uh, the folks from uh, Department of Human Services. I think we're starting with Ms. Pocine. Um, and so uh, Ms. Pocine, if you can uh, just remind, ourselves, remind us who you are and then please proceed with your presentation. Thanks. Certainly. Good morning, everyone. I am Lori Posseen, the manager of the Child Care Assistance Program within DHS. And, and please proceed. We, yeah. Yes, we have a slide deck. We're starting with the CCAP program, timely to some questions you just asked. Um, so uh, for those of you who need reminders or have not heard this before, the Child Care Assistance Program helps families pay for child care where parents go to work or school, and also helps promote uh, child development, healthy child development, and helps children have access to care that helps them also prepare for school. Uh, we typically serve about 30,000 children throughout the state. As mentioned, that was down last year, but um, anticipating it getting back up to about that number, um, or possibly even more with new funds. And um, proportionately, um, 69% of our children of color are American Indian um, children served by CCAP. Um, so it also, the program also helps address um, disparities and needs in throughout communities in Minnesota. And 62% um, of the children served by CCAP are five and younger. Next slide. So yeah, the outcome of the session, um, we temporarily reprioritizing the waiting list, which means that families who aren't getting served are um, getting services faster. Um, in the past, there was a transition year group of families who had left MFIP who got continuously served. Um, but what that meant was that they moved into the basic sliding fee program before families who weren't getting served. So that um, prioritization issue is solved through um, May of 24. Um, so that's why it's called temporary. Um, and we also, um, with the funds, we're able to boost calendar year 24. In addition, um, uh, the SIRSA, some SIRSA funds um, through the federal uh, availability of funds was added in 21, 22, and 23. Um, so the net effect was boosting funds um, for 
you know, a series of four calendar years, which um, should serve about 2,000 additional families and 4,000 children. And as mentioned, in November, there were 710 families in nine counties um, on the waiting list in, compared to the year prior, which was at um, more than double that number. Um, there is movement on the waiting list. Um, we've talked to almost all counties um, and many, many counties, and including those with waiting lists, who are moving off families. Um, Consistently, it's just that the the churn on the waiting list um, sometimes keeps up with uh, processing applications, seeing how many are actually eligible, and then moving on to the next group on the waiting list. Um, Ms. Bosina, I was just yes. going to ask if you if you wouldn't mind at this point, just uh, I don't know if there's anything further you can say in response to Representative Fryer's question about, and, and, and you may have at this point ad adequately answered it. I just want to, so as long as you're bringing up waiting lists, it feels like a, a good yeah. chance to. Yeah. So the question, the question being, what's what's the the reason that there are still families on the waiting list? I, I think or, I think Representative Fryer has. Uh, well, why, why don't we, uh, Representative Fryer? Why don't you just quickly clarify if you can, Representative Fryer? All right, thank you. And I think, uh, Ms. Pusin, that's that's kind of what I'm asking right now. And, and I think you've started to answer that, that it's almost, we will never perhaps able to completely eliminate the waiting list because it takes a while to process families. Um, but that really, you know, maybe at some point to understand how long a family might be on the waiting list and that time has been reduced now or eligible families. Yes, yes. So a couple... Yes, I'm sorry. Thank you. A couple things. Um, yes, the processing time. Um, in addition, counties um, can be hesitant, um, rightfully so, to make commitments to large groups of new families while they're um, assessing their spending, and they tend to do that three years out. Um, because once a family gets on the basic sliding fee program, they have to be continually served. And if the county overspends their allocation, they are on the hook, <laughs> um, unless there's sufficient statewide underspending to cover a county's overspending. So the calendar year allocations managed by um, counties and tribes are tricky. And, um, you know, um, many counties would be um, conservative on their spending side in, until they actually see how many commitments they're, they're truly making, um, which causes sort of a week by week, month by month assessment of those commitments. Mm -hmm. let, me, let me just see Representative Pryor, anything further? It looks like you're um, Representative yeah. Pryor. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I guess I'm just kind of some thoughts that I have when I when I hear that answer is um, that maybe one thing that we should be considering about considering is right now we've said that these are temporary um, that this change that we've made for the waiting list and it sounds like you know something that we might think about in the future is for counties the idea of being assured of certain funds is really important to make sure that they're not making commitments they can't keep in the future so I think you know that that's probably something that the committee should be aware of is that um, the stability of the funding that we're giving is really important to the counties because uh, they have to do budgets just like we do. So stability is, is important just as it is in the K through 12 funding also. And then the other um, point that um, I think is a takeaway from this discussion is that and we talk about workforce and how, to, how we can get people back into the workforce because we need workers in Minnesota. Um, the stability of funding for child care is going to be very important. So, um, you know, I, I appreciate this discussion that we're having, uh, Ms. Bosin, and um, thank you, Mr. Chair, for this kind of pause and, and as we review our work. Thank you, Representative Pryor. So, Ms. Bosin, please continue. Thank you. Next slide. Um, yes, yeah, so rates, the child care assistance program reimbursement rates um, cover part of the market. They don't cover the complete market, which is why we talk about percentiles. Um, percentiles um, that are covered are um, if you stacked the lowest to the highest rates in Minnesota for infants and toddlers, we cover up to the 40th percentile 
Um, so another way to think about that is under half of the market is fully covered by the CCAP uh, infant and toddler rates. And then the 30th percentile um, is achieved for preschool and school age groups. Um, so that uh, was funded last year, a, a no effective November 15th. And um, the benefit, if you will, <laughs> is that um, for centers, weekly rates did go up about 16%, and for family child care, about 12.5%. Um, and that is um, added, we added to that last year with, um, thanks to the legislature, with the um, uh, also a boost in legal non-licensed provider rates. Um, they had, um, had gone up and down in the past and had been previously at 68% of the family child care rate, and they were boosted to 90% of the family child care rate. Um, and the other provision um, in what passed was tied to the next market rate survey, um, which would boost the rates to the same market uh, access levels, 30th and 40th percentiles um, in 2025. Um, one uh, consistent uh, item we've talked about over the past few years, especially, was that the Federal Office of Child Care recommends states providing access at the 75th percentile, covering about three-fourths of the market that way. Um, and in 2003, Minnesota had done that, um, and since then, there were a combination of decreases and uh, the recent increases. Next slide. Um, I thought I'd show some examples of um, rate changes. We in um, Minnesota use a methodology cl uh, clustering um, like priced counties together. So we have four clusters throughout Minnesota. Um, they kind of tend to follow size of counties, not necessarily, but can tend to. Um, and so here's some examples of weekly center toddler rates, um, the rate before the update uh, shown um, by some example counties. And then you can see at the 40th percentile what the increase was. Um, so in, for instance, in Wilkin County, it went up by $15 a week. Um, and then the differentials um, which we like to mention because there are certain credentials and the three and four star parent aware ratings that qualify a provider to have a higher maximum rate. Um, and I'll say maximum rates are the highest that CCAP can reimburse, but we, we do reimburse up to only what the provider charges. So these rates you see here are maximum rates, not necessarily what we pay. Um, but you can see that the 15 and 20% differentials um, make a difference um, in access to the market um, for families who are uh, choosing care in their area, um, area of choice. So um, you can see that across all four of these counties um, examples, the uh, access to the market goes up when the 15 and 20% differential is applied. Ms. Wasim, we've got a question from Representative Waslewick. Representative Waslewick. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm not sure if Ms. Wasim can answer this question, but I know there's been a lot of discussion about um, sort of nationwide, like what states um, are meeting that 75th percentile and what states are not. And I'm wondering if, if you maybe can give us some information about um, like what impacts those. So, so one of the things that I've heard is that Minnesota has more expensive childcare than other states. So would that impact our ability to cover, um, if we have more expensive, if we have higher rates in Minnesota, would that impact our ability to reach that 75 um, percentile threshold or what sort of factors go into that? I'm just curious because I've, I've heard different things from different states and I'm wondering if you could maybe give us some of that information. Ms. Posseen, um, can you, and I, I, I should note, I, I believe that there will be um, uh, proposal. I know the administration has, has proposed to increase rates to the 75th percentile. We had heard a proposal, a, a bill on that last year as well. So I think we'll have a chance to discuss this at a future hearing. But if you can provide a, a little bit of information uh, to Representative Waslerick, um, that'd be great. Yes, thank you for the question. Um, 
Representative Wozniak and others, uh, we will have to get back to you really, because um, last year we did some research on where Minnesota was at relative to other states. We were in the lower, certainly quadrant, if not lower, uh, for access to the market um, before our rates went up in November. Um, and really we'll have to get back to you about like how that now compares based on what we can find out. And also it seems like there's a layer to that um, which is kind of compared to the private pay market, um, which every state does have to measure their percentile, which does compare to the private pay market. But in short, yes, the, the cost, the full cost, if you will, of covering most or all of the rates in Minnesota um, would go up um, if, if in general, child care costs are higher. Good, thank you. It looks like Representative Wozniak has, has done it again. That we'll have a chance to talk more about, about this, I know, in future sessions. So, so Ms. Pacine, please continue. Um, so the last slide we showed was center rates. We wanted to show that also family child care rates um, were uh, improved and um, same count, we're showing the same counties for toddler weekly rates, but with family child care. And again, um, showing that not only did the access to the market go up by covering more of the rates that are charged by providers, but um, with the 15 or 20% di differential, um, it again increases access to the market with those uh, higher rates. And then um, this was touched on um, a little bit. Uh, we are working on the family support and improvement program recommendations that the legislature asked us to create. Um, it, it kind of is building on the theme of um, how could information sharing um, at the local level improve effectiveness of public assistance programs. We've, um, it's been a topic of discussion with the preschool development grant. Um, so we were, we are working across agencies and within departments um, to gather um, some existing information and build on that to create uh, recommendations that we would bring back next year. I'll just note for committee members that I don't think that this is something that did pass through our, our committee because it was looking at public assistance programs more broadly, of which um, child care assistance is only one. Um, um, but I will be interested, I know members will as well when this comes out, but it'll be next next session. So we probably won't need to address it so much this one. Anyway, thank you so much, Ms. Um, And please continue. It looks like maybe you're handing things off to Ms. Swin uh, Swinson Class. Not sure. Let's see. Yes. Deborah okay, Deborah. so good. Ms. Winston Clyde, please introduce yourself and then proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning to you and members of the committee. I'm Deb Swenson Clad. I'm manager of child development services, uh, a unit within the child care services division alongside the child care assistance program. And thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today about our progress implementing uh, American Rescue Plan Act funded efforts passed by uh, the legislature last session. Uh, in addition to the CCAP provisions that uh, Lori just described, uh, Child Care Services Division is leading on implementation on a wide range of other provisions, and key among them are those developed uh, in response, as you had noted, Mr. Chair, to the Family Child Care uh, Task Force recommendations. Today's overview will focus on provisions in these three areas supports for family child care providers as businesses, uh, supports for and reforms related to training and education, and then uh, Parent Aware, Minnesota's Quality Rating and Improvement System. So I'll provide a brief description uh, and an update on the current status of each provision. And I know that the committee will be hearing from colleagues in DHS licensing on Thursday uh, on the uh, task, Family Child Care Task Force task force provisions um, being implemented by the licensing division. And, and Ms. Winston, uh, uh, um, what I'll just note, I want to make sure not to forget this, just to thank uh, Representative Wozniak, who's the chair of that task force, and Representative Damon, who served in the task force as well, and really appreciated the work of both of them in, uh, in advancing these. So I want to make sure not to forget that. So please continue. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, and I'll wrap up uh, this morning with an update on the Child Care Stabilization Grant Program, also funded by the government. 
So next slide, please. The first uh, new support for family child care providers as businesses, as, as well as other types of programs, child care programs, are the child care facility revitalization grants. Uh, and as was described in the walkthrough earlier, uh, 22.5 million was appropriated for grants to child care providers for facility improvements, minor renovations, and related equipment and services including those types of renovations that would help a program meet licensing requirements. And our update on this uh, new support is that the program is being administered through uh, a grant contract with First Children's Finance. Um, First Children's Finance is, uh, um, um, has work underway to um, finalize a program manual Applications for this new grant program for child care providers will be available starting in mid to late March of this year. Next slide, please. A second new support for family child care providers is businesses, again, as well as other types of programs, is a child care one stop regional assistance network. And 3 million was appropriated to develop and implement a plan to create this assistance network uh, to support child care providers and individuals interested in becoming providers with establishing and sustaining a licensed uh, family child care or group family child care program or a child care center. Um, among um, the progress that we've made on this front, um, a, a work group. Uh, was convened and completed its planning work in December of 21. Uh, per uh, uh, session law, we um, submitted an implementation plan to the legislature on December 31st, 2021. And that plan describes how the assistance network will be made available statewide through our child care research and referral system, which comprise um, or uh, are, is otherwise known as our child care aware system. And on the heels of the completion of that plan, funding for this initiative is being added to the grant contracts for our child care aware grantees. That funding will run through June of 2024. And um, immediately out of the starting gate, um, the child care aware system is um, post poised to begin hiring and training uh, staff uh, with the support of that funding. A new website will be launched, um, resources will be developed, and a marketing and outreach campaign will occur by April of this year. Next slide. A third support for family child care providers as businesses are grants to launch pilots for shared services innovation. So 200,000 was appropriated and direction was to provided to DHS to establish a grant program to test strategies by which family child care providers may share services and in doing so achieve economies of, of scale. Uh, our progress on this front is that an RFP for these grants uh, has been um, was designed and is posted. The deadline for responders is actually this Friday. And our goal is to pilot two to four, uh, uh, to fund uh, two to four grants um, with, to test different approaches for family child care shared services. The contracts will be in place by early April 22 and will conclude in September of 23. This next activity also supports family child care providers and other types of child care programs as businesses. And it's also the first of a number of initiatives uh, related to training and workforce supports that I'll, I'll move through next. So 3 million was appropriated to expand the availability of business training and consultation for individuals working in family child care programs and in centers to build and strengthen and acquire business skills. The funding for this activity um, has already been added to an existing contract. It is um, a DHS grantee, First Children's Finance, 
and the service is now available and the funding um, and the funding for this effort um, will run through June of 23. Moving on to some other supports for and reforms related to training and education and for family child care providers and child care centers. Um, this item or initiative um, Workforce Development Grants is supported with 3 million appropriated to provide economically challenged individuals uh, the job skills training, career counseling, and job placement assistance needed for a career path in childcare. Um, just noting that while this initiative didn't directly emerge out of the Family Child Care Task Force recommendations, we, we are including it here today um, to share an update with you. Um, it is, um, um, as is the case with the one-stop assistance network that I described a few minutes ago, our planning for this is complete uh, for these new services and um, per, um, per, per law, the, the um, services will be made available statewide through our Child Care Resource and Referral System or Child Care Aware System. And um, funding for this new program, uh, along with the one-stop assistance network funding is being added to grant contracts for child care aware agencies uh, as we speak. The new program is in process of being rolled out statewide and it will be fully implemented by July 1. The legislature uh, appropriated additional funding for a longstanding child care workforce support called the TEACH scholarships. Uh, TEACH scholarships uh, provide funding to cover 85% of the cost of tuition and books for early childhood professionals pursuing a degree in child development or early childhood education. An additional 2 million over three years was provided for this program. And for fiscal year 22, the funding, uh, this funding means that there'll be an increase for this fiscal year from um, a million to 1.4 million over the previous year. Um, small updates were also made to the authorizing language for the TEACH program. And uh, this funding um, and the direction to meet the um, changes in um, authorizing language um, have been uh, incorporated into the uh, grant contract for Child Care Aware of Minnesota. This service is currently available. Um, scholarship amounts uh, remain the same as um, in previous years, uh, in previous recent years, averaging about 4,600 per uh, scholarship recipient, but more students are being served as the year moves forward. Next slide, please. Similarly, the legislature appropriated additional funding for another longstanding uh, child care workforce support called the RETAIN program. The retaining early educators through attaining incentives now retention grant program was established in state statute last session to provide competitive grants to incentivize well trained child care professionals to remain in the workforce. So retained bonuses can be used for uh, uses like program supplies professional development or personal expenses um, that the recipients may have. 1 million was appropriated beginning in uh, this fiscal year uh, and um, up from um, just a modest amount of funding, 437,000 in fiscal year 21. And um, this will expand the availability of these grants over the next three years. Um, grants range from 500 to 3,500 per, per, per recipient based on their educational attainment. And the additional um, ARPA funding for this activity was added to the contract for Child Care Aware of Minnesota, who administers the program. The service is currently available. 30% um, of qualified early educators who applied for retain in fiscal year 21 were turned down due to lack of funding. And in the first round of funding in fiscal year 22, with this additional support, every eligible applicant receives support. On to the next slide. Here, turning to some of the reforms recommended by the Family Child Care Task Force, 
including the proposed creation of a more formalized approach to ensuring family child care provider input into training. Uh, beginning in, in 2022, a newly created family child care training advisory committee will convene to advise DHS on training requirements for licensed family and group family child care providers. 59,000 was appropriated to form and support this committee, which will meet from uh, between January, uh, between now and um, December of 2025. And um, on the um, progress front, a contractor, or excuse me, a contract for a facilitator has been established. The advisory committee members have been appointed and a first meeting will be held this month, in the month of February. Another reform recommended by the Family Child Care Task Force relates to expanding active supervision training options for providers. And um, what this means is that license holders and second adult caregivers will now have the ability to choose to complete either a two hour active supervision course developed by DHS or uh, complete any courses in the ensuring safe, safety competency area uh, under the health, safety, and nutrition standard of our knowledge and competency frame, framework that we've identified as an active supervision training course. So um, in other words, the, the number of courses now available um, has, has greatly expanded to meet this training requirement. 40 ad additional courses have been approved to meet meet the training requirement and have been identified for providers in our develop um, data system that providers use to search for training options. A communication about these additional courses was sent to all licensed providers by DHS licensing. So this um, uh, provision um, is, um, is underway and, and um, available to providers. And then finally, uh, a final recommendation for the, from the Family Child Care Task Force proposed funding for a validation study of Parent Aware before future updates to the Parent Aware standards and indicators are considered. And this evaluation also, uh, evaluation effort also includes um, an equity report. So uh, 1.435 million was appropriated for these evaluation activities. Um, again, the validation study and a report to explore childcare provider barriers to parent aware participation. For the evaluation, the larger val um, validation study a request for proposal uh, was written and re released and a process was conducted um, in fall of 2021. Uh, DHS is on track to finalize a contract with the selected vendor this month. Uh, the evaluation activities will then be carried out for several years with a final report delivered to the legislature in June of 2024. And then for the Parent Aware Equity Report, uh, we also proceeded to, um, uh, uh, with, a, with a contract with a consultant to carry out the engagement and outreach necessary to um, collect um, information from um, providers across Minnesota about barriers to participating in parent aware. That intensive outreach and engagement occurred uh, November through the beginning of January. And we are on track to deliver a report to you with findings and a plan on March 1st. So finally, I'll move through a couple of slides on the Child Care Stabilization Grant Program. The 2021 legislature created this program uh, in law to stabilize Minnesota's child care industry during and after the COVID pandemic. There's um, federal law as a part of the um, Federal Child Care Development Block Grant, grant through our ARPA that uh, um, dictates many provisions of the program. Uh, and state statute provides further direction on the purpose and uses of the program. The legislature allocated a total of 304 million in ARPA funds for the program of which, um, as was noted earlier, just shy of 300 million is available 
for direct grants to providers. And in addition, um, in December of 2021, the governor's office and DHS prioritized an additional 20 million from the COVID-19 flexible response account for Minnesota's childcare providers uh, in response to rising new COVID case totals in Minnesota. So I'll say a, a few words about that additional um, support for providers. So there are actually three, or excuse me, four types of grants or grant opportunities within the child care stabilization program. And this slide provides a, a snapshot of the current status, the duration, and the start date of each. The first three grant types were established uh, in the law passed in the 21 session, and they include transition grants, which were designed to stabilize the child care industry while DHS transitioned from the previous federally funded public health support funds program and work to finalize the implementation of the base grants. The grant awards uh, for the transition grants uh, were available to any eligible and interested provider and they were made uh, in the months of July and August 2021. And these grants have now concluded. The base grants, uh, which many of you might be more familiar with, are were developed to stabilize the child care market consistent with direction provided by the legislature and aligned with the um, federal requirements. These grants rolled out beginning in September of 21. And um, these are the grants that have been available on a monthly basis and will run through June of 2023. And then uh, the third type of uh, grant opportunity funded with the um, ARPA Child Care Development Funds uh, de, um, for stabilization are the financial hardship grants. Uh, uh, the financial hardship grants were developed or are developed to support providers experiencing extreme financial hardship, um, again, consistent with the direction in um, state and federal law. And the first application for these grants uh, opened uh, just last week on January 26th and closes February 9th. The grant funds are available until they are extended and uh, we are already planning for at least one additional opportunity for programs to apply in February. And then finally, the opportunity to apply for an additional uh, one-time supplemental grant was made available in January of 2022 to help providers with increased costs uh, resulting from the surge in COVID-19 cases brought on by the Omicron variant. Childcare providers had the opportunity to apply for these grants in the same uh, online application made available for the um, child care uh, stabilization base grants. So this application was open January 18th through 25th and providers could apply for a base grant the one-time supplemental grant or both. And this one-time supplemental grant opportunity is now completed. Moving on to the final slide. Um, this slide provides information on the funds allocated, the funding source and the grant award amounts for each type of grant for the four grants I've just described. For the transition grants, uh, the grants were provided, these were the grants that were provided in July and August. 17.3 million was allocated from the almost 300 million appropriated uh, from federal funds. Uh, the grant award amounts uh, were 600 per month uh, for family child care providers, uh, 4,250 for licensed centers with a capacity smaller than 75 children. 5,500 for child care centers with a capacity of 75 children or more, and 1,500 for certified centers. For base grants, these are the grants that began last September and continue monthly through June of 23. Uh, approximately, well, 211.6 million was allocated from the almost 300 million. Uh, for the broader child care stabilization program. 
uh, these grants are tied in several ways per state statute to the workforce working in our childcare settings. So one of those ways is as um, required in statute that base grant award amounts are determined based on the number of full-time equivalent staff who regularly care for children in the program. And this includes sole proprietors, um, like family child care providers, um, as well as um, employees of a program. And the programs receive $430 per month per FTE. Another way in which this program is tied to and supports the workforce is that providers are required to use at least 70% of their uh, monthly grant award to increase compensation or benefits for staff regularly caring for children. And in addition, the providers who, providers who have received recent payments through CCAP, um, early learning scholarships or both are eligible for a 10% increase in their base grant award for funding period. I'm gonna ask Ms. Bosin as you're proceeding, I hear a lot of feedback there. Um, if members have questions, uh, please uh, start raising your hand. I think Ms. Uh, Sw uh, Swinson Clatt, this is uh, uh, your final slide. Is that correct? That's correct, Good. Mr. Chair. Am I, okay. Uh, and so, members, if you have questions, I can see what Representative Wazalik does. Um, what I might do, uh, Ms. Swinson Clatt, is um, if there's uh, anything further about these final couple columns, if you can cover that fairly quickly, and then we'll, um, but certainly if folks have questions. Uh, about any of this, they can dive in. But I'll have you finish up, and then we'll go to Representative Wazalik. And other, if other members have questions, uh, I can see Representative Damoth will as well. So yeah, but Ms. Winston Clad, please, uh, please finish this up, and then we'll go to those questions. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So for financial hardship grants, the grants that are just beginning to support providers um, who are experiencing extreme financial hardship, approximately seventy million uh, uh, is set aside for this purpose. And due to the differences in how licensed family child care, licensed centers and certified center providers operate, there are different eligibility criteria for each provider type and the estimated grant award amounts vary too by provider type. Given that uh, financial hardship grant award amounts are intended to stabilize programs facing extreme hardship the grant amounts have been determined based on the average operating expenses of providers over a period of three months. And you can see the estimated grant award amounts um, on the slide. Um, there, is some there are some tiers of um, grant award amounts for family child care providers and centers um, for family child care providers um, ranging from um, 1500 to 4500 and then for centers ranging from 8,000 to seven, uh, 70,000, depending on the um, childcare capacity and operating hours of a program. And certified centers can apply for grant amounts of approximately um, 14,500. And then finally, for the uh, one-time supplemental stabilization grants offered in January only um, that were funded with 20 million, uh, from the ARPA flexible response account. Um, uh, these grants again have concluded um, and, have, and are being awarded um, this week. Um, the grant amounts um, that providers uh, will receive um, range from the 14,059 for family child care um, to 6,688 for centers and a little over 10,000 for larger centers and um, a little over 3,600 for certified. So I'll conclude there and happy to answer questions. I'll just note, Mr. Chair, there's a handout describing these um, programs that we thank provided to the committee. Thank you so much. Well, let's leave these slides up because I suspect some of the questions, I'm not sure where that feedback's coming from. Um, let's leave this up because I expect some of the questions have to do with this. Um, Representative Wazel, you had your hand up first, but um, since you'd spoken earlier, I'm inclined to have all of Representatives um, Damoth and Franson go and then we'll, then we'll work you in. So Representative Damoth, uh, we'll have you go first. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you, Ms. Uh, swenson Clapp, for the report. I know we've done a lot of work on the Family Child Care Task Force, and it's nice to see um, the details as they've come out. I've been looking for that. Um, my question um, is basically two parts. Going back to the child care facility 
revitalization grants, and that was on your slide 10. Um, you had talked about um, $22.5 million that the legislature appropriated back in June, but that those applications aren't going to even be starting until late March. Um, first, as a comment, that's very concerning to me. We know with the shortage, um, that we have in childcare across the state to know that we've been sitting on these dollars before applications even start is very concerning. But if you could please let me know when those applications start, what is the time frame, and then when can providers start expecting dollars to flow to them? Ms. Swenson Clapp. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Representative Damoth. Um, the First grant uh, round that First Children's Finance will be uh, will begin in uh, mid to late March. Um, will um, provide will will allow for providers to apply for um, these grants for facility improvements, minor renovations, and other um, services and supports. Um, I I believe that the um, grant um, the frequency of grant round rounds will be monthly. Um, so beginning in March, from then on, providers should have a monthly opportunity to apply for grant awards. Um, if I'm wrong about that, we will loop back to you, Representative Damoth, and correct that, um, that um, frequency of grant award amounts. But then they will be available um, for Minnesota providers um, all the way through June of 24. Ms. Swenson, can you comment on the uh, first half of Representative Damon's question about just the sheer amount of time, given you know the budget passed late June and then and then the timing of the applications in mid to late March? Yes, I'd be happy to. I I think Representative Damon and uh, Mr. Chair, um, we uh, faced a, a number of challenges in um, in DHS, frankly, in moving through um, contract work um, with the significant. Um, uh, influx of federal um, federal stimulus funds. So uh, um, there's there's just been a lot of work happening and um, um, effort to move contracting through as quickly as possible. Um, we um, also would have um, appreciated or um, um, liked to see this contract in place earlier than it was. I suppose the sheer number of different programs that we sent in your direction, um, but, but Representative Damoth, any follow-up that you have at this point? Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you uh, for the, the comments and the question, or the answers to the question. I'm still not understanding exactly when providers, once their applications are submitted, I'm not understanding when they'll actually see dollars. I understand the monthly ability to apply, but how long is that processing time of those applications? Ms. Swenson Clatt. I think we'll, it, um, unless I see a response pop up from one of my colleagues, um, I'm, I will have to um, provide that answer to you after the hearing today. Uh, and I know other members will be interested too, so please, please do provide that. Um, Representative Damoth, anything further right now? Thank you, Mr. Chair. And then the follow up um, just to that on the child care one stop regional assistance network report that was due to the legislature and submitted um, the end of December. I have not seen that report. So if that could be sent out to the committee, I think it would be beneficial for us to be able to look at the report. And that was on slide 11. And you know, Representative Damoth, I, I had the same question and our staff reminded me as I was sending some notes to them, messages to them that um, we had, uh, Ms. Breck forwarded it around on January 4th, I believe, um, but we will have, I'll have her do that again. To, this is to members of the committee. I had forgotten that we'd received that myself. Um, so we will make sure to, at least I think I'm talking about the correct report. Somebody can, can correct me, please. Um, but in any case, we'll make sure to send it back around uh, again. So thank you. Um, thank, Represent you thank you. So then Representative Franson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And so my question is, as we look across the nation and in our own state and in our communities, the message is that we are still in a child care crisis. Um, so my question is, those child stabilization grants, have they worked? Have we increased the numbers of child care providers? Have we stabilized the industry? Because what I'm seeing and hearing is that 
we haven't, and we have pumped millions and hundreds of millions into childcare, are we seeing a benefit with the money that taxpayers have invested in? Terrific question. Thank you, Representative Franson. So uh, Ms. Swenson Clad, I guess you're the one to answer that. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair and Representative Franson. The child care stabilization grants um, very much agree have been um, um, a, a major influx of funding uh, for Minnesota's child care providers um, that, that has just really started to roll out, of course, beginning last uh, July, August, and then September with the base grants. Um, they, um, this grant program follows on the heels of several other uh, financial support programs um, that are noted in the handout I mentioned. We've provided to you the public health support funds program and early in the pandemic, the peacetime um, emergency child care grants. And uh, we believe uh, Minnesota, um, the child care industry in Minnesota has indeed been stabilized by these um, uh, programs that we've seen um, a relative to other states, um, some other states, a um, lesser, a stabilizing effect for the industry. Um, that doesn't mean that the um, we haven't lost providers, but we've uh, believe we've seen um, less of less of the loss um, compared again to other states um, during this um, difficult pandemic that's um, stressed providers uh, so much. The stabilization grants aren't themselves aren't intended to um, help um, uh, launch new providers. Um, uh, but um, rather to stabilize those providers who are um, currently operating and open and serving children. Representative Hanson. Thank you. And to piggyback off that, are you tracking the those that have applied for the grants and if any of those grant providers have left the child care field and if so can we have those numbers also can we have the numbers of how many child care providers we had at the start um, of, of COVID-19 to recent days how many we have how many have left and how many new providers have entered the field so let's, we definitely, to this, that second part, let's definitely make sure that we get that information. Ms. Swenson, Clad, if you can provide anything now, that's great, but but, in, but we certainly would want um, to get information from DHS sent to us to share with, with the committee. Um, but then as far as the rest of Representative Francis' question, Ms. Swenson, Clad, please. We'd be happy to provide the information on the, um, the changing um, supply of childcare since the pandemic. I'm sorry, Mr. Chair and Representative Franson, what's the other part of the question that I could try to answer right now? I think the first part, well, Representative Franson, please, yeah. Well, my question was just the beginning of the COVID-19 to recent days of those that have applied for any assistance related to COVID, whether it be the stabilization grants or the grants early on in the peacetime emergency, how many providers that have accepted those funds and of those that have accepted the funds, how many do we still have in the field or have left the field? Ms. winston Clatt. Thank you, Representative Franson and Mr. Chair. Um, we can provide more detailed data, but I can share um, a partial response um, to your question right now. Uh, averaged across the six months of the, um, from July to December of the um, provision of the transition grants and the base grants, 61% um, uh, of eligible family childcare providers uh, received those grants at least once during that um, time period. 69% um, of child care centers received those grants. 60% um, of certified child care centers received those grants and 34% of legal non-licensed providers applied for and received those grants. 
Uh, I'll just, uh, before I turn back to Representative France, and I'll just note, it does seem like, and Representative France, thank you so much for bringing up these questions, because it, it does seem like, uh, you know, whatever detailed information we can get looking backwards as to the impact of this really series of grants, because this the stabilization grants, as you say, started in June of 2021, but that was a full, you know, we'd had grants going for the prior year series, starting with, I think we were the first state in the country to authorize state funding to to help stabilize the industry in late March of 2020 um, and getting a sense of what the impact has been of, of those rounds of grants uh, and to represent Francis point can we actually point to that and say yes that that I guess I had thought anecdotally at least that the money we put in early on meant that our state had lost many fewer providers than in other states but it occurs to me I don't think I've ever actually seen you know specific concrete numbers on that and having that sense would be really helpful so I'll turn back represent France and please continue but I <clears throat> just want to make that note um yeah so thank you Mr. Chair um and I thought I think that that information will be very helpful as we go forward in our committee this year um and yeah. then so back to the percentages you know the percentages are not really helpful without a actual number to go along with it. Like how many providers are we talking when you're when you're saying 69%, how many centers, how many, how many providers when you're saying um, you know 35%. So if we could have those hard concrete numbers to go along with the percentage, that'll paint a, a more clear picture for us on the committee. At some point, Ms. Winston Clad, I can see you nodding and yes. uh, further comments yes. on that. Yeah, Mr. Chair and Representative Franson, we do have those numbers readily available um, in the form of a of um, a document, and we'll be happy to send those over to you. Yeah, if you could um, also just send it to the entire committee, that would be great. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you, Representative Franson. And yeah, Ms. Winston Cloud, as I I think this is a great line of questions, um, and so I guess I'm, I'm noting for Ms. Sommerfeld as well, who does great work um, uh, connecting DHS and our committee. Um, that this would be a helpful um, set of uh, helpful information to have. I know it may take a little while to pull it together, um, but I think it's a really important point. Um, we are in our closing minutes. Representative Wazlik, is, is it something real quick? Otherwise, we can, uh, I think we can probably address on Thursday. Um, uh, but Representative Wazlik. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I just wanted to know um, I, I saw in Ms. Swenson Platt's presentation that the retain. Um, grantees, all of them were able to receive funding, which is great news. Do you have a number for how many grantees got awarded the first round? That was my question. Ms. Swenson Clack. And if you need to send us that that information and follow up too, perhaps. I think I do, Mr. Right. Chair and Representative let's, Lovely. Let's, let's, do, let's do that for timing and for nothing else. Um, so I do want to make sure to land the plane on time. Um, I just want to give a big thank you to uh, to the DHS um, team. I will note, I, I totally, totally understand Representative Damas' um, frustration with the time it's taken on those child care service grants. I will note in the public safety area that I also work in, there's some money that we had allocated in June that is still uh, it's still going to be another couple months before it gets out, and, I would, and part of it is just there's a lot going on. Um, uh, but I just um, uh, want to thank you both for your work in general and certainly for putting this together. Getting an update of each of these pieces is really helpful. Um, and uh, I guess we've given you some more homework to do today. Um, and so send us that, send uh, that to us. Um, members, I'm just a uh, heads up as I noted at the beginning. Um, so next Tuesday, the 8th at 5.30, we're doing a joint hearing at the Masonic Institute for the Developing Brain at the University of Minnesota Medical School, um, along with uh, the Workforce, Jobs and Workforce Development Committee. Um, if you can just let uh, the committee administrator, Ms. Spreck, know if you plan to attend uh, in person. I want to emphasize for members and staff, uh, attending virtually is absolutely a path that, that folks can take. Um, it's a facility is very well set up for that. For people who do attend, we'll have social distancing and masking. But again, if you want to attend virtually, you're very welcome to do so. I want to encourage staff to feel very free to do that as well um, with the, everyone's comfort level. Um, and then I do plan that, that we may well have a hearing next Friday, the 11th in the morning, tentative time at 1030. Um, and so next week, it would be 530 on Tuesday, our regular meeting slot on Thursday and then Friday morning. And we'll be getting more information out. I'm looking for any final questions from, from anyone. Um, but uh, it's been a, really good to be back with you all um, today. Remember that on Thursday, then we're going to continue hearing from uh, state agencies about the funding, um, uh, some of the budgetary decisions and getting updates and all. So I hope everyone has a great day. And with that, the meeting is adjourned. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.